Hello everybody, Ardo Kados here. Um, so we hit another audio issue during this podcast. Just seems to be part of the course. Um, I mean, episode one, that was seven or eight different takes before I finally got a usable recording. Uh, episode two, um, we had a little bit of issue with Nellos' recording. Uh, episode three, um, obviously I had to re-record a bunch of my dialogue because a lot of it was, it just, uh, it was unusable. Um, very similar situation this time. Um, we did tweak some things. I moved my equipment around, uh, tried a, a couple different things, and, and a lot of the audio on my end is still usable. So, um, however, I, I did what I could to tweak it, but there's still some uh, very scratchy um, feedback. Uh, my... Uh, voice kind of goes up and down. Uh, it, it it gets low to like it, I sound very demonic. So I apologize for that. I I swear I'm not possessed. And um, uh, quite a bit I did have to re-record, but uh, uh, this, what I could save is I still kept in there. So um, you can definitely hear it. Uh, and uh, I apologize for that. Uh, and, uh, this time I did have a backup mic set up, however, I couldn't time it right, I'm not sure what I did wrong there, but, um, every time I thought I lined up the cues right, it just, the dialogue was off, uh, it just, none of the audio was lining up, so, um, you know what, the show must go on, uh, not the best, in audio quality, at least on my end, uh, but you know we're getting better. I'm gonna just look into different uh, recording platforms because maybe because we record on Discord, and maybe maybe it just doesn't like me. I don't I don't know. Uh, maybe the the recording bots just don't like my equipment because I've used this that I've used that mic for other things and it works fine. Um, Brand Agara at the time didn't hear anything wrong while we were recording. Uh, I did have to leave and come back at one point, because at one point there was an audio issue that, that they could hear, um, but neither one of us knew anything until I listened to the recording back the other day, um, it's just, it's getting way too late again to try to re-record and just do it over, so, um, I'm gonna just Frankenstein this thing back together, uh, but what we talked about still turned out really, really good, so I'm still happy with it. Uh, just forgive the obvious audio flaws on my end of the conversation. Um, we will get better. Um, definitely going to look into better equipment, uh, better... There's, there's something. There, there, there's, a, there's a key to this. I, I've almost found it. And then I'll, we'll start producing more top-notch, top-level uh, audio quality. Um, but you know what? Brian Agar and myself, we're not professional podcasters. This is something we're both very new, new to. So just bear with us. These episodes will get better over time. Um, thank you very much, and enjoy the show. Episode 4, The More You Know, A Brief History. It has been a very long week for <laughs> for Brent Agara and myself, so we're a little loopy this time, and we're going to be talking history, so um, that should be fun for everybody. All right, so as a quick disclaimer, uh, neither of us are historians, so if something is incorrect, we uh, encourage you to go ahead and message us or send us an email or something along those lines. But please don't uh, be mean about it because we are not historians. We are pagans. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I, yeah. So I also want to add that um, we did a lot of research and jotted down a lot of notes. But to avoid making it sound like we're reading off a essay, 
we're going to try to not read things word for word and try to um, make it a little loose and organic. Like Bernagara said, um, we are not historians, we're not scholars, uh, not really academics, and even if we were, there's not a whole lot about Gaulish history, mainly because the Gauls didn't really write about themselves. So the sources we have are typically from outside sources like the Greeks and Rome, and the number one source, unfortunately, is the conquest of Gaul by Julius Caesar, which, safe to say, is just a little bias. Just a wee bit. Tiny bit of bias. Yeah, just a little bit of bias. And then uh, after that, we, we don't have a guest this episode. I just We just couldn't make it happen, and we probably shouldn't rely on guests all, all the time. Yeah, I'm going to try and break it up so that we only have guests uh, every couple of episodes. And besides, most people can just do the research themselves, buy the books, look up the information themselves. So I didn't need to, to try to find an expert of some kind. Although that would be cool. Yeah, but um, we couldn't really find anyone. In, and um, we're Americans, so a lot's been going on in our country that's been a little distracting, to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I know it has been for me. I I have been completely absent on social media except for my my responsibilities uh, for the different social medias that I run on for the Tata Galation, uh, Instagram and Twitter and the the Gallcast stuff that I make pictures for and my own personal work. But yeah, a little distracted this week. <laughs> yeah. All right. So what we're going to talk about today, like we said before, is who the Gauls were, at least briefly, kind of just a, a general overview of who they were and when they existed and where they existed mm -hmm. and things like that. Let's get started. Absolutely. I, I covered this briefly back in episode one, but the continental Celtic peoples ranged from as far west as the Iberian Peninsula, also known as the Celtiberians, so uh, Spain and Portugal, as far east as uh, Romania, I think parts of Poland, uh, even Anatolia. Um, but the big three, the big three of what is Gaul, were France, Belgium, and Switzerland. Now that does also include Luxembourg, parts of Germany, and Austria. But those three are what are more iconically known as Gaul. So the Gaulish people came from the uh, Proto-Indo-European or the Piai Pai people, who. <laughs> <laughs> Supposedly, I think the co the consensus is that the uh, the Celtic people um, originated uh, somewhere around the Danube River and just went west, uh, settling across the European continent and, and uh, of course, going all the way to the British Isles. As far as language goes, what we do know is that the Gaulish people spoke what obviously Gaulish. As the Celtic people traveled west, they settled, and um, this language spread out and. Different dialects most likely formed. Um, I don't think there's anything solid, but you know it, it just makes sense because languages they evolve and they uh, they transform over time. And when you think about it, the Galatis of the Anatolian Peninsula are not going to speak the exact same form of Gaulish as the Celtiberians. It's one of those things that if you think about it, like um, how a person from California and how a person from Georgia who are native to those states speak English, it's a different kind of English. It's different accents. It's different dialectical differences. How we speak English in America versus how English is spoken in England is also very different. So that's kind of one way to look at it that kind of breaks it down a little bit. The tribes are all going to have their own dialect of Gaulish. Absolutely. The thing that really separated the continental Celts and the insular Celts was culture. For the Gauls, it was the Latene culture. So the Latene culture was kind of a continuation of the Hallstatt culture, which preceded it. The Hallstatt culture started roughly around 800 BCE, and then uh, kind of started to die out about 500 BCE. By 450 BCE is when Latene had uh, officially replaced it as the culture of the area. And what's interesting is that it spread out from Switzerland, because I believe there's a town there called Latene. And that's kind of what, not only what defines it from the insular Celts, but is what defines Gaul away from. It's also what really helps define the territory of Gaul, Belgium, France, Switzerland, from the other continental Celtic peoples. That uh, that culture is very specific to that region. I, I don't, I'm not sure if it spread out further than that. Um, I, I 
didn't really look into it, and we'll probably do an episode on that um, sometime, maybe uh, next season or so. But as far as art and uh, weaponry, Latene's got this very organic, like vegetative, swirly, flowing um, art design to it. If you were to Google early Gaulish artwork and weaponry and, and armor, you'll definitely notice the um, very viney, flowing, um, almost like the movement's captured, very organic. It reminds me very much of, it reminds me a lot of the elvish armor from Lord of the Rings. Like The designs were, were meant to look like, it, like, like it's moving. Um, like the movement is captured in the artwork into the uh, art, the shields, the sword. And that's possibly where the Triskelion comes from. Um, I don't know for sure, but it's very plausible. That's where the Triskel, the Triskelion came from. The Triskelion is something I use a lot in my artwork and my crafting. Um, it's almost like a personal signature. I use it a lot at work to identify my tools, as an example. It, it's just a, a symbol that um, means quite a bit to my to me. I wear one. Oh, awesome. Cool. The Gaul settlement was typically open, uh, built around the uh, chief's hut, which was in the center of the village. As time went on, uh, they would eventually start building walls, and uh, I believe the Roman term is opida, and it was commonly made out of wood. It wasn't really any masonry. I'm not sure if it's a lack of uh, materials or uh, just a choice to use wood. Who, who knows? But uh, I think... The more significant thing is that the within these settlements, there were various uh, trenches built for votive offerings and, and various sacrifices, showing that the Gaulish settlement was centered around spiritual practices and, and religion. Something I found that was very interesting in my uh, research was very much similar to how Christians had relics, which were the remains of dead saints. Yeah, it's like this saint's finger bone and this saint's toenail. Yeah. Gross, but yes. <laughs> Something that we notice a lot in Gaulish art and, and whatnot, and uh, definitely in a very literal sense, is this... Uh, um, word. Anyway, the, the Gauls really had a thing for severed heads. And uh, we're not... I, I, I'm not 100% sure if it's... Um, I think I read somewhere, I can't remember the source off my head, that they would have kept possibly the heads of ancestors as maybe a way to gain uh, physical strength or maybe courage or bravery in battle. Um, probably uh, kept the the heads of enemies as a kind of a, a fear tactic. Well, and also in um, general Celt beliefs, didn't they believe that uh, the seat of the soul was the head? Which means that if you take an enemy's head as a trophy their soul is not going to move on. So it would definitely work as a fear tactic, theoretically. Uh, yeah, yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. And that definitely leads us into uh, a topic on the Druids, who are definitely going to get their episode at some point in maybe next season or so. But the Druids were not just spiritual leaders, but they were also political advisors, artists, bards, musicians, um, keepers of history. They just were held in high regard among all the various tribes of Gaul and, and just in Celtic society in general. They pop up all over insular and continental uh, Celtic history and mythology. They're definitely going to get their own episode, but the Druids were definitely a big deal in Gaulish society. And uh, something we mentioned previously is the long list of, uh, of Dewoy or gods that uh, Gaul had. Uh, there are so many. So so many it's like every when i go <laughs> when i go through gall chat and i see someone like talking about a, a deity that they've discovered or that they're you know freshly devoted to like i have no like it, I, i'm always learning something new every day and it's, and it's awesome but yes it is almost overwhelming at times how many uh <laughs> how many gods of gall there are well, and a lot of it is, um, if you think about it, because the the, Gaul, the Gaulish people were so scattered and so tribal, what you're looking at is they have a god of a local river. They have a god of a local mountain. They have a god of X and a god of Y. And each tribe, given their location or you know what they focus on, is going to have a pantheon of gods that's going to just be massive because... Every single Gaulish tribe, while they all have similarities, are individual tribes. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, and that, that's, um, that's definitely going to lead to um, the next episode, which is animism, 
which is definitely like the key of uh, Gaul's polytheism, why there's so many gods, because as, as you said, you know, they, you had a god for these very significant features of each tribe, like the Helvetii, they were in the Swiss plateau, so mountains and bears are very prominent in in their in their deities. From what I've seen so far, uh, hot springs, rivers, streams. If it if it was sacred to the tribe in any way, it definitely had a, had a, a deity to it. Now we don't. We also don't know how many deities that are the same deity under a different name, depending on where they are. So one Gaulish tribe might refer to Kernonos as. Kernonos and another one might refer to him as something else. Uh, it might just be a small change linguistically. It might just be an entirely different name altogether, but it is the same deity. So that might reduce it some, but it would still be pretty high up in the triple digits of how many deities the Gaulish tribes have. Absolutely. So it's a we're going to do a whole episode on Gaulish deities, and I assure you that we are not going to cover all of them. We're just going to cover what we refer to as the big guys. <laughs> I don't think there's enough time. People are trying to cover all of them. There is not enough time and there is not enough research to do. Well, there's... Um, <laughs> that would be able to produce right? between 300 and 500 deity names. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm a year into my reconstruction work and I've got maybe five, five that I've like done some research on. And I'm still going back and like updating my articles. Between tribes, it could just be a spelling difference. It could be the same. We, and that's the thing is we're never really, really know if it was the exact same deity or not. Like uh, Windatus and Windonus. Literally, it's just a couple letter changes, but from two neighboring tribes, probably the same. I mean, logically, it probably is the same, but I try not to assume. And in other cases, like with Aneklamara, there's Aneklamaras. Again, the same two tribes. It's just same, basically the same deity, <laughs> just gender swapped. Yep. Yeah. Um, like, I'm interested to know if Karanonos and... The female version of Kernonos are the same, just gender flipped for the comfort of whatever tribe, um, or if they are actually different. I can't remember her name off the top of my head. It's similar to Kernonos, but I'm curious to know if they're the same deity or if it's just a gender band because Kernonos is the deity of liminality. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah you never know. So <laughs> But that is that is definitely uh, one for a an episode all its very own. Yeah, um, and that but, and that's definitely a rabbit hole. I don't. I, I'm very tempted to jump into now, but we don't we don't want to do that. We don't. don't, don't do that. We have a whole episode for that rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, yeah, it's definitely down the road. It'll be an interesting episode. It'll probably be very scattered, and uh, we apologize for that ahead of time. Yeah. Um. So as far as self designation goes. We don't actually know what the Gauls called themselves. What we have is what other people called the Gauls. And we have some modern scholars that have some guesses. And uh, I mean, it's probably as good as we're going to get until we find something written down somewhere saying, hey, we call ourselves this. Julius Caesar has Celte as what they would have called themselves. Which I've also heard is Caltoi. I believe. Yeah. Um, Keltoi and Keltoi. Keltoi is the more Greek. I think Her yeah, Herodotus uh, has Keltoi. And then specifically Gali for, for Gauls. And then modern scholar uh, Kim McCone has Keltos and Galatis as something that they would have called themselves. And I think, based on what I've read, Galatis might be the, the more likely because it's... It might be more accurate, more likely, because it is based off an actual Gaulish word. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Gala, you know, which means courage, galler rage, and some. It's, it's got a lot more roots than, uh, than Keltos. That, and I mean, mm. given the... Given the time in which they existed, they may have just referred to themselves as their tribe's name. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's very true. It, they may not have referred to themselves as anything other than just their tribe because the Gaulish culture was incredibly tribal. Absolutely. There were so many warring tribes, allied tribes. It, it, like, I don't even think they saw themselves as, as anything unified. I don't think they saw themselves as a whole people necessarily. I think they saw themselves as their tribe. So Galatis might be the best like the most likely but keltos is still acceptable modernly uh people like uh the tauta galation uh we refer to ourselves as galatis yeah yes absolutely um and keep in mind i'm not a linguist and i am likely butchering that word and i admit freely that i only speak one language and even that is questionable for those that follow our social media the words of the week that i do i ask at least two different people on how to pronounce it because I'm probably not pronouncing it right either. <laughs> That's all right, though. Yeah. So the Gaulish language itself uh, is definitely one that is still 
being debated and discussed both in the academic realms and in the Gaulish polytheism world. And frequently those do actually overlap. The Gaulish language, like we said, is going to be, it's going to change and vary area to area because like all languages, what they, the version of Gaulish they speak in France is definitely not going to be the same version of Gaulish that they speak in Germany or in Austria or in Belgium. It's going to vary. Even Belgic French and France French are different. In France, they have Parisian French and non-Parisian French. So the language itself is definitely one that is very up for debate and is actively being reconstructed. Um, But it is definitely uh, something that is debated rather strongly. There are those who rely solely on the Lepontic writing system and those who don't. Now, do you want to go into the Lepontic stuff? Because you're much better at the language than I am. I am terrible at it. <laughs> I am also terrible. And every time I brought up the Lepontic and the Logano alphabet, I'm told by someone how I'm so close. So I'm just going to go over the bare bones of it. And if I miss something, I'm very, very sorry. Because uh, I've written an article on this. I have not published it yet because I am scared. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> so the Lepontic... <laughs> The Lepontic language comes from the Leponti tribe, who I believe were a Ligurian people that eventually developed a Celtic identity. They were located what is now border of Switzerland and, um, and Italy. So the Lepontic language uses the Lugano alphabet, which was found in Lugano, Switzerland, which is where the Leponti tribe were said to have uh, mainly inhabited. They were influenced by Etruscan and Italic characters as time went on. You can definitely see more and more Roman and Greek influence, you could say. Doing the air quote fingers. They kind of moved away. Buddy, they can't see. I, I, that's, <laughs> that's, why I'm, that's why I'm narrating. <clears throat> there. <laughs> so when, when Rome invaded, we did see more Latin and uh, Greek out letters being thrown in there. If I'm remembering right, forgive me if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong here. But uh, the Lepontic language predates Elder Futhark, and you'll definitely notice some characters there that are very rune-looking. Um, nowadays, we call, we call them the um, Gaulish runas. Now, this language did not get very far. We'll, you'll, you'll definitely notice it in northern Italy, Switzerland. It just, it, from what I've seen, it didn't really creep further out than that. But it's, it's something I use in my divination practice. Uh, they're very cool to work with. I like using them. But it, as far as a written language, that is the closest uh, closest thing we have. And I, I just don't think it made it as far as like the Normandy or Turkey, um, Spain. I, I, don't, I, I don't think it made it that far. I might be wrong. As far as I'm aware, um, it was uh, a very concentrated area. And then slowly it was replaced with Latin and Greek writing systems, which, you know, as we know, like the Romans do with everything else, they killed it. Mm-hmm. Now, as far as we can tell, the Gaulish tribes initially came from the Hallstatt culture in 800 BCE and then fully formed the rise of Latene in 450 BCE. Now, the thing that's different about, uh, about the continental Celts versus the insular Celts is that the insular Celts are insular for a reason. They were not particularly influenced by much in the early days of their forming their cultures, whereas the Latene culture was influenced by the Mediterranean, so Greek, Phoenician, Etruscan, things along those lines. You're going to see a lot of that worked into it. They were an active, heavy trading culture. All of those were heavy trade cultures, and they traded with each other a lot. Um, a lot of the major source material we have historically for the Gauls were from Greek, um, Sicilian, things like that, uh, Roman, and not necessarily from the Gauls himself, as I don't think that they really wrote anything down. No, they really didn't. That's a weird Druid tradition. I'm not sure if it was intentional or, or what, but they didn't write anything down. Caesar had an Adui chieftain and Druid. I believe it was both, I believe. But his name was Divitiacus. He did relay some information to Caesar, who wrote it down in his memoirs, but again, we don't really know what's biased and what is accurate, because... It's Caesar. Probably a good 30% of it at the minimum is exaggeration. Yeah, he was very much, um, (laughs) look how awesome I am type of guy. So take it with a grain of salt, but you know what? It's it's better than absolutely nothing, which is unfortunately the thing with the Gauls is that they didn't write anything down. So in the 4th and early 3rd century BC, 
<laughs> the Gallic clan confederations expanded beyond the territory of what would become Roman Gaul, which does define the, the use of the term Gaul today. And it would expand into Pannonia, Illyria, Northern Italy, Transylvania, and some of Asia Minor. And then by the second century, the Romans described Gallia Transalpina as a distinct from Gallia Cisalpina. Mm -hmm. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. And then in the Gallic Wars, Julius Caesar, again, distinguishes among three ethnic groups in the Gauls. In Gaul, uh, the Belge, who are the Bel Belge, 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 I, Belge, I'm assuming. I, I'm, I'm, I'm um, assuming it's Belge. <laughs> but the Belge in the north, um, which is roughly between the Rhine and the Seine, the Seine, Seine. The Seine, yeah. I'm so bad at pronouncing these words. <laughs> um, the Celte which is the center in Orca and Aquitani, and then the southeast was already being colonized by the Romans. In the 2nd century BC, Mediterranean Gaul had an extensive urban fabric and was prosperous. Archaeologists know of cities in northern Gaul, including the Biturigian capital of Avericum and Borges, Cenobum or Cenobum in Orléans, Autricum in Chartes, and the excavated site of Bibract near Atun in Sonne et Lore, I, I think that's I think that's how it's pronounced. Along with a number of hill forts used in times of war, the prosperity of Mediterranean Gaul encouraged Rome to respond to pleas for assistance from the inhabitants of Massilia, who found themselves under attack by a coalition of Ligures and Gauls. So this happened twice: once in 154 BCE, and then again in 125 BCE. The first time the Romans just kind of came and went, but the second time. They decided to stick around. In 122 BCE, Domitus Ahenobarbus managed to defeat the Elobroges, allies of the Suluvi. While in the ensuing year, Quintus Fabius Maximus destroyed an army of the Averni led by their king, Bituitus. Bituitus? B-I-T-U-I-T-U-S. How it's pronounced, I have no idea. Who had come to the aid of the Elobroges. Rome allowed Massilia to keep its lands, but added to its own territories the lands of the conquered tribes. Direct result of these conquests, Rome now controlled an area extending from the Pyrenees to the Lower Rhone River, and in the east up the Rhone Valley to Lake Geneva. By 121 BCE, Romans had conquered the Mediterranean region called Provincia, which was later named Gallia Narbonensis. The conquest upset the ascendancy of the Gaulish of any tribes, and it just snowballed from there. It just got worse and worse and worse for the Gauls. Which is always not fun because, you know, the Romans. Yeah. yeah. So after all of this happened in the following years, Rome forged alliances with a lot of Gaulish tribes, like the Aedui, for example. Many of them were very, very anti-Rome, and their war bands would join up into wars against Rome, like Hannibal of Carthage and the Germanic Simbi tribe when they fought Rome during the Cimbrian War. It is possible that events during the Cimbrian War fa were factored in when Julius Caesar came into the story, but then in 58 BCE, the Gallic Wars began and was recorded in a detailed account written by Caesar. Now, again, it, it is our most detailed account of the Gallic Wars, but, and you're going to hear us say this a lot, it is a very biased narrative. Um, regardless of its bias, it is incredibly valued because one of the most detailed accounts we have. Now, he pushed his army into Gaul in 58 BC, uh, quote unquote, to assist Rome's Gaulish allies against the migrating Helvetii. Now, with the help of various Gallic, Gallic clans, he managed to conquer nearly all of Gaul. And while Gaul was, Gaul's military was just as strong as the Romans, the internal division, because Gaul is so tribal, sort of guaranteed an easy victory for Caesar. And then, I can never say his name right. Vercingetorix. Vercingetorix. There we go. <laughs> did attempt to unite the Gauls against the Roman invasion, but it came too late. Julius Caesar was checked by Vercingetorix. I can never say it right. <laughs> it, 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 th <laughs> thing is, I'm not, so I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing it right. That's just the way I've heard it. For sing you know what? It's it's a hard name. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of there's letters a in there that I feel like don't need to be. Oh, there's a lot going on in that name. I know, I know. Um, so he checked him at the siege of Gergovia, uh, which is a fortified town in the center of Gaul. Now, because of Caesar's alliances, many Gallic clans broke, um, even the, the Adwi. 
who were their most faithful supporters. They threw in their lot with the Averni and the Remy, best known for their cavalry, and the and the Ling, Lingon, Lingones sent troops to sent troops to support Caesar. The German Ubi also sent cavalry, which Caesar, Caesar equipped with the Remy horses. And then when he kept at uh, the Battle of Alicia, which I am assuming we're probably going to go into a little bit more detail of, oh, yeah. uh, Caesar captured Vercingetorix, which effectively ended the Gallic resistance and more or less ended free Gaul. Now, this is an incredibly important battle for us historically because it really did end free Gaul and it became Roman Gaul. I mean, there were still revolts and, you know, various Gaulish war bands would rise up here and there, join other invading armies. But yeah, as far as Gaul as its own independent power, that, that ended at Alessia. It broke it. The reason why is as many as a million people, probably, probably one in five Gauls actually died. Another million were enslaved. Uh, 300 clans were subjugated. 800 cities were destroyed during the Gallic Wars. The entire population of the city of Avaricum, which was about 40,000 people, were slaughtered. And before Caesar's campaign against the Helveti, the Helvetians had met, had numbered well into the 260,000s, but afterwards only 100,000 remained, and most of them were taken as slaves. Remember, uh, he was assisting his allies. That was not a genuine... Yes, and this was all under the flag of Julius Caesar as a super helpful person he who was, was just, just assisting his allies. He was just helping his buddies. There was no genocide going on there. None at all. After that, Gaul was absorbed as Gallia, which is more or less just a set of Roman provinces. The inhabitants gradually adopted aspects of Roman culture, and they assimilated, res- resulting in what we refer to as the Gallo-Roman culture. Citizenship was granted from the 3rd to the 5th centuries. Gaul was exposed to raids by the Franks. The Gallic Empire, which was consisting of Gaul, Britannia, Hispania, and Baetica? Ba- sure. Baetica? We'll yeah, yeah. Ba- Baetica? I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, they broke away. It's okay. I'm, I'm, keeping, <laughs> I'm keeping all this in because it's funny, and we're, we're just trying. We're trying so hard. We're trying. We're trying. Baetica in the south um, broke away from Rome in 260 to 273, in addition to a large number of the natives. Gallia also became home to Roman citizens from everywhere else, migrating in from Germanic and Scythian tribes um, like the Alans. The religious practices of inhabitants became a combination of Roman and Celtic practice, with Celtic deities such as Cobanus and Epona subjected to Interpretano Romana, or the uh, Gallo-Roman um, religion. And we'll definitely have an episode on that. That'll be next season. Yeah. And then the imperial cult and the Eastern mystery religions also gained a following. Eventually, after it became the official religion of the empire and paganism became suppress- suppressed, Christianity won out in the twilight days of the Western Roman Empire. While the Christianized Eastern Roman Empire lasted another thousand years until the invasion of Constantinople by the Ottomans in 1453, a small but notable Jewish presence also became established. Yeah, like a lot of like like a lot of pagan cultures, um, Christianity rolled through, and when it rolled through, it suppressed and murdered where it could. It rolled through uh, hard and Christianized as much as they could, causing a lot of the paganism to be suppressed and practiced maybe only at home or if only at home only in small ways now the gaulish language itself is thought to have survived into the sixth century uh, but only in france despite the considerable romanization of the local material culture france sort of seems to be from what i can gather what was the heart of gaul the last records of spoken Gaulish that was plausibly credi- credible was with the destruction of Christians uh, by Christians of a pagan shrine in Avern called the Vaso Galate of the Gallic Tongue, coexisting with Latin. Gaulish helped shape the vulgar Latin dialects that developed in the future into French. Which is neat. Um, it, it's, now, it's neat. I didn't, when I was researching this, I didn't know that French is kind of a descendant language of Gaulish. So that, that was really cool to hear. Now, the vulgar Latin in the region of Gallia that took on a very local character, some of which is actually attested to in graffiti, evolved into the Gallo-Roman dialects, which included French and its really close relatives. Now, the vulgar Latin in the north of Gaul evolved into languages D'Oel and the Franco-Provencal, which is the Provencal French. And the dialects in the south 
evolved into the modern Occitan, Catalan, things like that. The other languages that are held to be quote unquote Gallo Romance include Gallo Italic and Rado Romance languages as well. And we will in fact be doing a language episode later on next season and it'll, it'll be in more detail. Now with the fall of Rome, the Germanic tribes and the other quote unquote barbarians, cause you know, if you're not Roman or Christian, you're a barbarian. Uh, <laughs> Came as well as Christianity. Gaulish culture was obliterated. Places like Switzerland, where the Helvetii tribe and other Alpine tribes are, would be completely stripped of any Celtic culture and replaced with Germanic ones. But it's not all lost, even as Gaul evolved and changed with the times, and much was preserved and maintained. Switzerland would hold tight to its Roman moniker of Helvetia, and then later Helvetica. And then much more was carried on to the modern world. Vercingetorix. Vercingetorix? Is that right? There we go. Is actually seen as the first national hero of France. And while the ancient Gauls are gone, their memory does live on, whether it's through us modern Gaulish polytheists, many of who are tirelessly working on preserving and reconstructing the language, the religion, the culture. They have survived into the modern world, just not in a way that many people would expect. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Despite all of our reconstruction efforts, we're never going to recreate the Gaulish culture completely, 100%. That's just not going to happen. But through what we have found of them, through archaeological finds and through what we know now, we can develop and create a modern Gaulish custom and modern Gaulish culture and just create something new based on the old. Well, and through art, through weapons through jewelry they've made and even their, you know, what they can find of shards of pots or coins or torques. So much of that does still live on, even if it is just through archaeological finds, whether it's linguistic, artistic, how tactics are done, even if they're just casually talked about it by a history professor at a university who's teaching about, you know, the Roman conquests back then. Gaul is still represented and it is still there. And as Gaulish polytheists, we are working very hard to reconstruct everything. And we're not the only ones. There are plenty of archaeologists and academics and linguists who are working as well. And while they may be doing it for uh, off the fascination of academia or, you know, their obsession with Gaulish swords, you know, whatever it might be, it is still present and it is surviving in the modern world. And what we're trying to do as polytheists is bring it a bit more to the forefront, which is a large part of why we're doing this podcast. We want people to understand that it's not gone. Gone does not mean forgotten. So that is all we have for our brief look into Gaulish history. Like we said, it's not perfect. It's not exact. It's not going to be entirely historically perfect or academically accurate. But neither of us are academics and neither of us are historians. No, we are not. But still tried and we wanted to do right by the pronunciations of both Gaulish and France. Sorry, France, for all the mispronunciations. Most of them, and I apologize profusely for those of you who cringe every time you hear us butcher a word. It's going to happen in every episode. This is a passion for us. It is our faith. It is our religion. It is the modern culture we're building based off of the culture that was destroyed. And a lot of the reason why there's not a ton about for us to go through and pull academically or in a written format or anything like that is because this came so far before Christianity. And a lot of what you find on Celtic history and Celtic myth and Celtic everything across the board, a lot of it is stuff that was written post-Christianity. And there's not a lot written about Gaul that is post-Christianity. Yeah, it's very true. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and move on to our virtue for this episode, which take it away. The virtue for this episode is waria, which is duty. Branagaro and myself are veterans, so duty is something that we are very familiar with. It is this sense and calling to do what is right and what is necessary of us, kind of like uh, keeping an oath, if you will. Waria is whether... It is a, a mundane or a difficult action. It is always for the greater good of the community or tribe for necessary services. So it might be um, like my job is in the Tauta is that I am the treasurer. It is not an exciting job. Nobody's excited about being a treasurer. 
but it's a necessary job that needs to be done in order to track finances for the Tauta. And so that is my duty. And I take it very seriously. I keep an eye on it all of the time. And it is how I serve the Tauta as a whole. My job within the uh, the Tauta is I'm part of the social media team. So anyone that follows and Tauta Galation's Twitter and Instagram accounts, that's me. I uh, I try my best to either create or find artwork or other articles that people are writing and I try to share them to help benefit the Gaulish community. That's a duty I take very seriously as well. I'm not always on time. Sometimes um, personal life gets in the way and maybe I'm a day late, maybe I uh, I miss a week or so, but it never goes any further than that. Now, it might be that someone's duty is something like they write articles. It might be that they organize events. It might be that they open their home to, well, okay, when there's not a pandemic, let's preface that. It might be that they open their home to Tauta members as they're traveling through somewhere. There's any number of things that it can be. And your duty is something that benefits the Tauta as a whole or the the tribe as a whole. And I say Tauta because that's my primary group. <laughs> but it might be, it, it's just, it's something that's going to benefit everyone as a whole that you sacrifice for, that you devote your time for. And it might even be something like uh, when members of the community get together, you cook. It might be that you take care of a park. It might be that you plant trees. It's any number of things that would fall under that. Yes, absolutely. It is everyone's duty within a tribe, particularly small groups like what you and I are used to. You know, everyone's got their part to play. Everyone's got their duty to maintain order and civility and just promotion and growth to help the community thrive. Everyone's got their duty and part to play. And looking at more of a historical context, you know, we've been talking about Vercingetorix quite a bit. I I can't think of of a better example of duty than what he did at Alessia. You know, beforehand, while it was a little too late when he tried to assemble all the tribes of Gaul against Caesar, it was still his duty to do what he could. And obviously Alessia did not end well for him. He was captured. I'm not, I think he offered himself up to save the city. I can't, I don't remember off the top of my head, but that's just a, an outstanding example of doing your duty to help the tribe, help your people. Within a community, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is without each individual performing their function, then there's not a community. Each individual performs a function and a duty in the understanding that we could not function without a shared willingness of amenability. That is actually on, on the Tauta Galation website uh, under Uaria. And it is so important to remember that everything that we do for the greater good of the community and the tribe for necessary services. It's pretty straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I don't try to get too political on here. I know I brought up a couple recent events as examples that typically kind of fall in line with what we talk about. But on January 6th, we had a horrible example of what happens when people don't comply with duty, when they ignore Wadia for personal, selfish, flat-out stupid reasons, and the effects that it has. We had a horde of misled and misguided, misinformed people that ignored their duty and attacked their own capital based on baseless stupid lies. They completely ignored Waria to commit this dumb, stupid, stupid, stupid riot that ended with the lives of five people ending unnecessarily. You had political leaders, congressmen, senators, lawmakers who finally saw what their actions in enabling an orange Caesar essentially in these ridiculous lies and self-delusion, grandeur, and narcissism. And it took an angry mob storming the Capitol for them to realize, oh, probably shouldn't have fed into that. They ignored their wadia for personal gain. And of course, the orange elephant in the room, her current president, who is getting out of here soon, hopefully sooner rather than later, completely ignored wadia and ushered in and provoked and enticed this insurrection against his own people. It's insane. It, it just shows that's what happens when you completely 
disregard your duty, disregard Wardia as a leader, as the leader of a nation. Ugh, it's it's so disappointing and so embarrassing. Yeah, when it becomes about being about personal power versus the greater good. But I think that is all that we have. Yep, that's it for this this episode. And I'm um, sorry for my little tirade. Uh, as you can tell, I was a little frustrated and distracted this week. So I'm glad I got that out of my system finally. Anyway, why don't you tell them how to find us on social media, Renegara? All right. So please make sure that you do follow us. We are at Gallcast Podcast on Twitter and at Gallcast on Facebook and Instagram. We do not have a TikTok page because you're not going to catch me doing anything on TikTok. Nope. Not touching TikTok. Because no. <laughs> Uh, but we also have a website, and that website is www.gullcast.com. And uh, you can catch us on any of your favorite podcast streaming sites, as we are all over the place, including Apple Podcasts, which shares over to a bunch, uh, Spotify, uh, Google Podcasts, uh, you name it, we're probably on it. So please make sure that you go ahead, you give us a follow, you leave a review, you um, let us know how we're doing. You can also contact us via email at gallcast at gmail.com. And thank you again to our Patreon supporter, Jay Internus. We super appreciate your continued support. And if you are interested in helping support us either through monetary support, which would be super fabulous, uh, which you can find us, uh, you can find on our website a link to our Patreon. Um, and there are several levels of uh, membership. Uh, or you can just listen in, follow us, and like us. Leave us comments, things like that. Share us out to your friends who might possibly want to learn about Gaulish polytheism. <laughs> uh, our next episode is going to be What is Animism? Don't you mean animals? We don't mean animals. Uh, and our <laughs> our uh, guest will be Bronos. And Bronos is uh, incredibly interesting and well-versed in all of the things animism. Uh, and we look forward to having him on our show. And again, thank you so much. Yeah, Bronos is a great guy. We've mentioned him before. He's going to be a great guest. Can't wait to, to interview him. Uh, if anyone's got any questions for Brynos or us for the next show, um, just send them to us through the various social medias that we just talked about. Well, thanks again. See you guys next time. Mm-hmm.